kid. Seriously. <laughs> to a giddy return of the Star Wars in Review podcast. We're the only podcast that's going to borrow your car and return it even better than you found it. She, she won't get a scratch. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, who once got a speeding ticket in Lake City, Minnesota. And over here, it's Maya Madrid, who got him that speeding ticket because he was driving my ass home to lacrosse from Minneapolis. Every so often, we get together, discuss news in the realm of Star Wars, answer some, some uh, questions that we got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and whatever you do, don't swallow your gum. That shit sits in your stomach longer than a death sentence in the belly of the almighty Sarlacc. Luke Neitzel, how are you? Oh, a city boy is exactly what that cop said to me when he looked at my license well, and saw right. that I was from St. Paul. And I knew that it was all over from there when I got that ticket. But <laughs> Didn't you Didn't you fight that ticket? Uh, yes, I drove. It's probably not that interesting a story, but I drove an hour and a half to go to court to fight that ticket. And the kid in front of me was like 16 and he was going 30 over. And he just told the cop that his odometer must have been broken because he doesn't think he could have gone that fast. So the judge threw out his case. And I was like, I'm golden. I was going five miles over what I thought the actual speed limit was, you know. And uh, I got a 20-minute lecture on responsibility and $5 off my ticket, which did not cover the gas to go there. You realize what your problem was. I was a city boy. That's damn right. <laughs> what else is going on in your life other than speeding tickets and being a city boy? So I am very proud of myself because I think there are a lot of fantastic adjectives you could use to describe me, but handy is not one of them. And <laughs> well, I it depends on who you're talking to, buddy. That's true. That's true. But I built uh, the fire pit in my backyard, and I am extremely proud of it because it looks halfway decent. Really? And that is one of our favorite things to do here when it is the summer, is to crack open beers and have a fire. And our house had one, but it was made of wood, which isn't a good way <laughs> wait, to... Wait, wait, wait. Fra- yeah. Okay. I, okay. I didn't even know it was... There. I bought I bought the house in the winter, so I didn't even know it was there. The snow melted, and we were like, oh, we have a fire pit that's made of wood. So... Bad design. That didn't work so well. So after four years of being here, I finally just went and bought the stuff and did it myself. And now it looks like it actually belongs there. So I'm you know, excited to crack that open. We've been friends for almost 20 years, and it's it's hard for us to find new things about each other. But I don't know if you knew this about me. One of my favorite things to do is eat and drink outside. Well, now we got so a place. Now we, get, we, can, we can do this. Perfect. Hey, speaking of goings on and domestic stuff, I have just switched domestic roles with my wife. And here's what I mean. I don't mean switching the duties. My grandparents had always talked about how they have this rule where my grandfather um, does the work outside and my grandmother does all the work inside. And so we've been married, what, eight years, me and my wife, and um, we kind of had it all mixed up. So now we, we flipped everything. I do everything inside and she does all the yard work. Dude, it's been going on for two weeks. It's been amazing. Nice. It's been a huge change. I realize that, like, that's probably also not very exciting, but it's very exciting to me. Well, we have a very similar system, my partner and I, where I do all of the work, and then my partner gives me critiques on how well I'm doing it. And we move forward that way, and it works very well for us. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. I like that. Well, let's talk about the news. The early returns are in on Solo, A Star Wars Story. It seems to be vacillating right around the 70% mark on Rotten Tomatoes. And when I last checked, it was at 72% approval rating, uh, which is a little bit up by the critics. Luke, you know how I hate to admit when you're right. It happens so little of the time that when it does, it sticks out in my mind. Neither of us have seen this movie yet, but it seems to be hitting right in that fun time, but with some flaws, middle zone that you predicted. Luke, is this what you expected from an RT score? And how do you think it's going to affect the box office, if at all? And are you at all disappointed? This is, it, as you said, what I predicted. It's what I expected. I think the box office is going to do fabulous. It's not going to be the highest grossing Star Wars movie by any stretch of the imagination, but it's going to make Disney a ton of money. And as I predicted last week, it will get a sequel. Because I think it will do well enough. And people like these characters well enough. I, You know, yeah, sure, I would have loved to, to everyone to walk out and say it's a masterpiece and it's something totally new that we've never seen from Star Wars and it's amazing and it blows your mind. But that wasn't going to happen. I knew that wasn't going to happen. The fact that people don't totally hate it is 
great. And this is the area I thought it could go for, and that's what it appears to have landed in. And good, good for it. You know, I'll, I'll still see it, and I'm sure I'll have a good time as well. I got to admit, I'm a little disappointed. I really enjoyed the trailers. I really wanted this to be a smash hit as far as the quality of the film. And obviously, I'm not, I don't know until I'm going to see it, but I'd be lying to say it doesn't deflate me. I was hoping somewhere in the 85% region. I also believe Kathleen Kennedy when she said that this was the best script that had ever been written in the Star Wars universe. And, I mean, I guess... Maybe Still could be. It, yeah. There's more to a movie than the scraps. That's true. People are saying it's boring, though. Part of it. I mean, I, I we were selling this whole thing on adventure, and... Uh, I don't know. I'm disappointed. I wish it was better. Well, I, I'm going to sidetrack us a minute because we're we're in the luxurious Camero Studios, yes. which is also my basement, yes. which does not hold sound very well, even though it, it doesn't echo too bad, I don't think, when I listen to us back. But uh, upstairs, my, my lovely partner has heard our, our discussion and just texted me that she is far too pretty for domestic work, and that that's why <laughs> we work as a team, because we, we know where we fit in the system, and we go with it. So She's if, saying that I'm not pretty. Because I'm doing domestic work. I think she's saying that you and your spouse are equally pretty, so you split the work equally. Where we may have a I divergence think... in the attractiveness of of our relationship, which means that I have to bear a heavier workload. I think that's a bunch of bullshit. Eh. Second news story. I oh. think I look like David Villa personally. So <laughs> you do look a little that's, like David. That's Villa. what I'm going for. It, it beats Paul Ryan or Mark Riley comparisons. So. <laughs> Hey, uh, this past week, the internet got in a tizzy after news services began to report that an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie had now been greenlit by Lucasfilm boss lady Kathleen Kennedy. Is this another thing that I said last week? Shut up. Hey, a report said that the director and the script had already been approved and the train was ready to get started. However, it seems that confusion and misdirection reigns. You see... The source of all these rumors is the ever-responsible, always-reliable TMZ. Oh. Worse, the language for the synopsis was lifted directly from the Legends Obi-Wan Kenobi novel. That's amazing. <laughs> Luke, last week I think we both said we felt like the Obi-Wan movie was going to happen. I think we may also agree that these shenanigans by TMZ are par for the course in the world of clickbait. But, it still brings up the question, why the delay in announcing this? Are they holding off to see how well Solo does? Or perhaps might a Lando movie leapfrog an Obi-Wan movie if Donald Glover's performance is as good as the critics are saying? Can I throw out a crazy theory that has no basis and I thought of about 15 seconds ago? As long as it doesn't critique the, or doesn't contradict or do the one that I'm going to have in about 10 minutes here. Please, oh, please no. continue. Oh no, I was going to say, what if... Now I'm nervous. What what if Ryan Johnson or Benioff and Weiss are doing Obi Wan movies? Well, that's not what I was going to say. That is a good movie. And good idea. and that is that that's what one of them has been working on, and that's what they're building towards, and what they're going to announce. And they've kind of thrown people off that way. I think that would be kind of exciting. I'd be I'd be very happy if Benioff and Weiss or Ryan Johnson was doing an Obi Wan movie. Um, I would probably lean towards Benioff and Weiss because I. My impression is is that they might not necessarily be doing a set trilogy, like they might just be doing a series of movies that could all be independent of each other in the Star Wars universe, and I would like to to see them maybe maybe tackle that, but I'm a massive Ryan Johnson fan. I love all the movies he's made, so I'd be okay if he handled that too, and Ewan McGregor is hands down the best part of the prequels, so if he's coming back and he's doing something with, with either one of those teams, I think that would be awesome i agree i think that is that's a that would be awesome um but i don't my guess is that it's not going to be that way i think disney's at a crossroads and waiting for solo to see if these nostalgic films would be better than the films that push past the original mythos you had rogue one and now you have solo so rogue one is kind of new but it, it harkens to a little bit of the nostalgia but you also have solo which is like all in on the nostalgia and i think they may be sitting back you got i think you offered a fair point too that i think they're looking at what donald glover has done just in yeah. the last week and all that and going holy crap we, we got this guy locked down we need to push him front and center which right. could make him leapfrog some things and if i don't know if you ever read the the lando trilogy 
But that made me love that. Yeah, <laughs> read, read something. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I'm sure. sorry. Uh, but it was it was a really good, fun series. At least when I was in high school, I loved it, and that made me love the characters. So seeing him, uh, whether that's in the Millennium Falcon or the Lady Luck going off and you know swashbuckling and doing his thing, I think would be amazing. A buddy team up movie with Lobot? Yeah, well, who doesn't exactly. want that? I, who, yeah, absolutely, we want Lobot. But getting back to it, you know. Seeing if these nostalgic films are going to work, or maybe these new sort of... You got kind of two different boats. You got the Game of Thrones dudes and Ryan Johnson and John Favreau camp. And then you got, like, these, lo, you know, Lando, Obi-Wan, we've heard about Boba Fett, and those camps. And I I, I think that, that Disney might be trying to see the makeup of the... the of what happens with Solo. Like, Solo is like the fulcrum on which Disney decides... Or I could be completely wrong, and they just shotgun and do everything. Which is also, <laughs> like, which is probably what they will do, right? They're just going to make as much money and just squeeze the the squeeze the lemon absolutely dry. On a long enough timeline, you will get a Boba Fett movie. That's true. So we should probably move on to uh, emails that kids seriously got. Last week during this segment, I couldn't get through the questions that we got from Gabe and Jed, so it's probably good that we didn't get any email this week. However. In our other show, where you recorded and edited the blooper reels, you ended it by calling me an idiot. And I just wanted you to know that I'm not going to stand for that. Okay. So that was needless, and it was cruel in a moment of weakness, and I thought it was mean. Well, and do you remember me saying that while we were trying to go through the the questions? No. Because I didn't. Uh, I recorded that in post. No, no, I, yeah, yeah, I that it was yeah. Well, and but honestly, the reason was is because the blooper reel had no natural ending, so I had to throw something Just in there, and that was the idiot. quickest, easiest solution to get us there. So I took it because you know that's what I do, and you know. He who holds the editing button holds the power. That's what I want to so say. So I'll just think it'll be fascinating to see if anything you're currently saying actually ends yes. up in the final show. <laughs> I have a little problem where I I get the giggles and I can't stop, and so. Uh... For all of the people who tuned into that particular episode of Maya and Luke Saw a Trailer, um, that's kind of how things often get when I get you well, know, sillies. And it's funny, too, because we probably have about, I don't know, two to three times per episode where one of us goes, okay, just stop. Yeah. And then we'll redo what we said. It's it doesn't. Me. Yeah, but it's still only about two to three times per episode. And that was like a four minute chunk where. It was like every 10 seconds we had to start over because you couldn't make it through. But that probably just meant we were working off fun material. So I, I don't think it's too big a, a drawback. And it wasn't as hard to edit as I thought because I could just take up the whole cut chunk. most of it and yeah. save it in a new track for the blooper reel. And then just go through and make a few slices to make it a little, little more coherent in the actual show. Well, it was a lot of fun. And I thank Gabe and Judd for sending in those questions. I, uh, I, it was, I think I talked to told you that i was in a conversation with them and i was like hey you guys got any questions for the show and just started rapid firing that so hey if you're out there uh uh if you're at home or on the road or in the car at the bar what are you up to right now why don't you send an email to kids seriously radio at gmail.com ask us questions we can read on the show and if you're listening via youtube give that subscribe button a smash and help us take it to 13 here before we make the jump to itunes at some point oh my gosh Season 1, 16, The Hidden Enemy. Truth enlightens the mind, but it won't always bring happiness to your heart. Which, actually, I think could have some weird, serious consequences in this episode. You don't say. Did say. Directed by Stuart Lee and written by Drew Greenberg, we find our heroes on the planet of Christophsis. The Jedi are taken by surprise by Separatist droids during battle. Something strange is afoot. Obi-Wan and Anakin believe there is a creeper in their midst. Luke! Take it away. So do you, I'm assuming that the writer who wrote this has a son named Christopher, right? That's the only way to say that you named a planet 
Kristoff. I thought it was going to be some sort of like. Well, first of all, I thought it was going to be spelled with a K. It's not. No, it's it's, it's Christopher with S I S at the right. end. Right, and then I thought maybe it was going to be something religious, like maybe like a critique. But no, it was just yeah. No, I guarantee you that whoever yeah. wrote this, their kid is named Christopher, and that's Christopher Lee. Ooh. Wait a second. The circle is now complete. So we open here on the planet of uh, Christophysis or whatever, where it is under attack, as most planets are when we come to meet them. This is a new storyline. And the droids are making a heavy push to take this planet, which we are told, for unknown reasons, is very key to everyone's plans. So Obi Kin, as we're going to go by in this one, are sent there to try and turn the tide of the siege that the Separatists are currently waging on this planet. So we open up basically mid battle, and what I liked about this is that it was urban warfare, yeah. which I think is the most interesting to watch visually, and we haven't gotten a ton of. It's in more Clone compact Wars. than anything that we had seen. More urban with towers. So I yeah. had a little bit of problem. They were all like in a line, and I think maybe that the the great people of Christophysis or whatever it's called, maybe that's just the way they do their buildings, or the animators could have been lazy. Where it could have been more organic looking. But either way, at least it was busier and it wasn't just some big rural setting. Exactly, because most of the planets feel like they're populated by like 15 people right. that they're battling for. And this, with the big city setting, made it feel like it it was completely full of people, which was kind of a nice change. So we open up there and Obi-Wan or Obi-Kin have basically already landed and are, and with Rex and... Uh, Commander Cody, and they are looking to try and turn the battle here. They have a little plan that they're going to work to try and overtake these droids, and suddenly that plan goes straight to hell as the droids know exactly where both Anakin and Obi-Wan are. They are in separate buildings that are basically across from each other, but the droids seem to know everything that is going on with them, and they immediately attack. So this one jumps into action right away. And I, I feel kind of stupid, as you noted earlier, by calling me an idiot, but also because the name of this episode is The Hidden Enemy. And I was like, wait, what? They saw this whole column of droids coming, and now it surprised it. Like, I was genuinely shocked, so I don't know... Uh, the, I don't know why, but I was. Yeah, because the Hidden Enemy title will become very, very obvious when we get into more details of the story. But uh, a battle takes place, they fight, they basically have to abort their mission because they know the droids are about to overwhelm them, and in the battle they are able to make it to the rooftop of both buildings, meet up together, and they slice the head off, basically, the droid that is leading the assault, and are able to take the head with them, and they escape to their base camp that they're positioned out of on this planet, and they take the droid head and they are able to pull from it the memories or recordings of what is going on and are able to find out that the droid knows everything about their battle plans, which points to there being a spy. Now this is what, the third, fourth, fifth, maybe 20th time that there's been a spy thing here, um, or spy episode. And I was, I was wondering through the entire, the entire thing, yes, I like the landscape, but the animation is poor in this episode. It is on pace with the Clone Wars movie. So I dug a little bit deeper, and this is actually the second one that they did. They did oh. it, and chronologically, it actually comes before the movie. So I was thinking about that, went and looked, and I was like, oh, that makes some sense. I really, I'll, I'll let you go on here, but I will say that there's a little bit of a twist about something new that I enjoyed, um, but I was kind of like, oh, really? Another spy? How many times have we done this this season? Yeah, but the way, the way they did it in this one didn't, didn't bother me as much uh, i actually found it slightly more interesting than than other takes on spies they've had though there are still problems to be had so basically rex and cody are the ones who scan this robot with r2 and determine that there is a spy they talk to the two jedi who are there and the two jedi for reasons that kind of escape me decide they're going to go to the head of the the battle droid army that's on this planet and just the two of them and take it on but they want cody and rex to work together to find out who the spy is, which led me to what would have been the significantly more awesome uh, spinoff show, which would have been a buddy cop show about Rex and Cody <laughs> running around solving crimes together. I think that would have been amazing because we got a little bit of that in this episode and it was pretty fun to watch. But they decide to find out what's going on. They are able to trace some of the transmissions and realize that it is coming from one specific unit of clone soldiers. They actually realize at first 
that they are being listened to by someone and they have a little bit of a chase sequence where they realize it's a clone they chase after him they try to kind of corner this clone so that they can arrest him but the clone runs into the mess hall which is full of other clones and they realize well it's one of our our brothers and we all look the same so there's no way to tell who in the mess hall it is but they're able to trace it which back which is why I like this twist clones yes. on clone distrust i thought was a great yeah made it a little bit fresh where at first i was disappointed it, exactly i thought that part of it was pretty cool and they they realize that it's part of uh commander slick is the person who is running this section of clones so they decide they're gonna go there and try to figure out who it is and they take a very bold strategy which seems pretty horrible where they sit everyone down in the unit and just say hey we don't want to use a traitor so now we're going to individually question you all in front of each other which doesn't seem like the best strategy a detective would use but they only got 28 minutes so they gotta do what they can with it so they question each clone they go through it clone by clone and the clones all have alibis and people that kind of you know corroborate their alibi and then we get to the last one who is battle scarred and he was in the mess hall but he got there a little late and he's a little bit of a loner are you talking about chopper chopper okay yep this is chopper the clone who basically says oh you know all the other clones have very good reasonable alibis that they can count off of and chopper's alibi really doesn't fit and it, it could be the spy it fits right into that so the Jedi are suspicious. Commander Slick steps in and says something about how, oh, you just have to wait till the Jedi come back. They're going to question you. You have rights, blah, blah, blah. Which, clones have rights. Who would have thought that yeah. ever in a million years? <laughs> Evidence seems to point to the contrary. but Yeah, pretty much. But what happens then is that Cody and Rex both realize there's no way that Slick should have known that the Jedi were gone because that was secret information between Obi-Wan, Obi-Kin, and Cody and Rex. Okay, so we'll get to Slick in a moment. I want to stay on my guy Chopper. So the weird part about what Chopper's been doing, he's been going around and cutting off the fingers off of uh, battle droids and making necklaces. Amazing. Which was flipping awesome. Amazing. Obviously a call out to Vietnam, which was just great. It made me like this episode a lot more. At this this point, like I, I was really kind of in on this episode. Um, that was definitely for adults, which was right. a fantastic little kind of Easter egg. And the, the, I can't, I can't figure out. And maybe this is just a deeper thing that, that Star Wars talks about, but I can't figure out what droids are because these clones are pissed that he cut the fingers off the destroyed droids, but they still treat droids like they're non sentient beings. And I think that you know, do clones feel differently about droids because of where their place is? It made me think of all sorts of cool things about the place of a clone in the world the place of a droid in the world the place of an enemy in the world and man the jedi are dicks my impression was wasn't that they cared about the the droids as entities it was that he violated protocol to go back and take those droids things and that he should have stayed in formation with his troops and that's what they were upset about i don't think they actually cared about him taking battle droid fingers Per se. I think that's even better than. <laughs> yeah, I because I don't think they think of the battle droids as anything. Um, which I guess why would you? I mean, they've they've been set up to be easy to not have feelings about when you kill them throughout the whole course of Star Wars. So, I I don't I don't think that's what they were going for. But but Cho- Chopper was a a fun character design. I mean, he looked like hell. Like yeah. he looked like he was shot with a flamethrower in the face. Which, you you know, they try to differ the clones a lot, but you don't see a lot of them that look battered and destroyed by war, which is what most of these characters would be. And immediately, if you're a kid, you're going to think that's the guy. He looks scary. Oh, yeah. And and that was what they were going for. But as I mentioned, uh, Slick actually gives a little too much information away, and the Cody wait, and Rex... Wait, wait, wait. The guy Slick is the guy who's the spy? Who would have who thought? Uh, I kind of wondered, because this is kind of a weird, crimey episode, and I'm sure I'm extrapolating more than is necessary, but I wondered if that was a callback to the movie Heat. I haven't seen Heat. At all? Oh, you haven't seen Heat? No, I know. I know. Wow. You're not the first person to mock me for it. I'm not going to mock you, I'm just surprised. But I I thought... Mock me your head, you liar. Probably. You are such an idiot. That brought me back to uh, that. So I I wondered if that was a callback. It probably wasn't a a purposeful callback, but that's what I I took from that. But anyway, it's revealed Slick is the traitor. Now, this episode is very jagged in how it's edited. So that story didn't happen consistently 
with the other B plot that was going on. They cut back and forth, but for the sake of our viewers, I decided to lay it out one storyline at a time. So the other story that's happening at the same time is the two Jedi, Obi can make it to the center of the droid facility or base or whatever you want to call it. And it looks kind of empty and they go in there and they find they have someone waiting for them there, which is Ooh, my girl. your girl Ventress, who is exceptionally flirty with Obi-Wan. Yeah, she really likes her some Obi-Wan. There was some sexual tension going on there. She's not raised mom? We have Oh my god. That would be amazing. I'm back in on weird (laughs) legacy theories if it's if If it's Ventress. Ventress, I will hundred percent go on that or grandma but you picture Daisy Ridley, she's got kind of like that round head. The bloodlines off her mouth or whatever those things are. Yeah. Uh so they get into a lightsaber battle with Ventress who basically is just wasting time keeping them away from the the base. Uh, she is obviously in cahoots with Slick, who's been giving her information. And she has also alluded that they have much more going on to complete this plan than we are being told in this episode. Which could be interesting, because I don't know if they're going to follow up on this episode or not after this. But there seems to be a greater master plan. So hopefully they continue that. She distracts the Jedi. They have a decent battle, but it's got some really weird elements where she throws a bunch of tiles or books at them or something, and then she stops and, like, starts monking out on the floor or whatever and then slices them down into a basement. It's it's an odd battle. I appreciate that they were doing new elements, but I don't know if it entirely worked as a cohesive battle. It feels It feels very Clone Wars movie to me. It feels like... Yeah. I mean, I think that's because this is the product of when it was done. Who it was written by, how it was edited, it's kind of old it's, school feel it's half a season ago. very intercut with Rex and Cody interviewing the soldiers. So you see 10, 15 seconds of them battling Ventress, then you go back to 20 seconds of Rex and Cody and back and forth. And it almost felt in the lightsaber battle portion that almost like a different writer was writing each cutback because they didn't really fit together. But the whole point basically is that Ventress is distracting the Jedi from the things that are happening back at the clone base she's able to escape from them and then basically show hey i have a massive army of droids here that are about to wipe out your your clones and i've wasted enough of your time and this fits into my grand plan or my master's grand plan that will be unveiled hopefully later or my master's master's grand plan oh my too many levels wheels within wheels uh we then to to go back the the jedi then go back to the base slick is able to escape because basically he thinks like a clone so he knows what their the clones are going to do better than the clones are doing we know that star wars likes to introduce new powers they do so the the clones are trying to to find him because they think he's going to escape but really what he's doing is destroying all their weapons caches he destroys their uh they call it their weapons depot and he takes it out, which be- basically is setting the stage for a greater invasion army to come. Now, they do end up catching Slick because Rex and Cody start thinking like a clone, would think that was thinking like a clone, etc. And are able to to catch to him. understand a criminal. You he must think like a criminal. Exactly. You have rules, and you think they'll save you. But they, they end up capturing him. We do know that uh, the clone army is coming under the leadership of General Lo the Sum. Which is a, a pretty ridiculous name. I actually rewound it and turned the subtitles on just to make sure I heard that right. But his name is General Loathsome. But that's fine. Or whatever. This episode was losing me a little bit. Yeah. It, it felt like it should have been a multiple story arc to find Slick and all those things. It felt like they rushed it too much for me. Which made it less interesting than if you're trying to discover which clone is actually the guy who is betraying them. But it really came through in the end, which some of these other episodes have done, because Slick brings up points that we, you and I, have talked about in general. He verbalized, basically, that he thinks the Jedi are bullshit. He's anti-Jedi. He is all about his clone brothers, and he has betrayed them because he doesn't want his clones to be this disposable, abused slaves. I think he actually says, we are slaves for you guys, and I'm not willing to accept that. And I went, holy shit, I'm kind of on your side at the end of this because the clones are kind of garbage slaves. Now, Rex and Cody make the counter argument that, well, you killed a bunch of us and you put us all at risk by doing this, 
which there's some truth to as well. But I loved how he turned this into multi-dimensional. You know, the the Jedi are pieces of shit, <laughs> and the clones are treated like human garbage. And there is more levels to this than just your basic good guys versus bad guys. And that, for me, saved a lot of this episode. Yeah, in, in my notes, I have it ranked 10th. Out of 17? 16? 16. 16. But I think, you know, looking at it again... Because the movie think... will always be last. Right. Just for anyone right. who yeah, knows, so no matter what happens, right. no matter what Jar Jar, you know, falls and humps his way through, the movie will always be worse. It is. It was bad. But I think, you know, you could make an argument for me that it could be... As high as seventh, we're in that seventh and ten. Like episodes that I like, but ha- are, are extremely flawed that I can't say that I love. So for me, and I, you, you go by rankings. I go by the Laura Dern Pew scale. This gets two pews, and that was a hard decision for me to come by because I think there are elements of this episode that are really good. The overall idea of what they were going for with there's all these clones and Rex and Cody have to work together to figure out which clone it is. Detective story angle. I enjoyed that, but I don't think they executed it well. They rushed it. His mono, Slick's monologue at the end about how the clones, man, that that's, that's awesome. Great. That's everything that I have complained about in this show almost entirely. Are you in, a separatist? Well, I am 100% a separatist I think I am for the too. most part. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I'm not a fan of like the leadership. I'm not a fan of like no. uh, Darth Sidious and that sort of thing. But you know, the people like that Cassian. Are in... I can see why Cassian is. I, I I can see why the people on the council would be into this. I can see why a system would join the separatists over the Republic in a w- easily. I can easily see why they would do that. And Slick brought home a lot of the points that I see flawed in the Republic, that I see flawed in the Jedi, which I really hope we get into more as this show progresses. But it's still a two Q because everything in between it is... eh. Right. It makes me... Like, this... The Clone Wars series has made me like the prequels more. Because it, it... The prequels are trying to get at that, but this is really bringing out that argument a lot. It makes me think more about that whole time period i think it brings up a really interesting side discussion the side discussion of did lucas intend for the jedi to look like incompetent pieces of shit or did that just happen and other writers have taken that and elaborated on it because i honestly do not know i could see it going either way and i think it's fascinating to try and figure out which which of those it's going do you have a hunch? Do you have a belief? Do you have something that you would like to think? Like, where do you sit on it? Because I know what I so, think. So, Attack of the Clones especially comes out in 2002, uh, which is about a year, oh, less than a year, probably 10 months before the invasion of Iraq, but part of the build-up to the invasion of Iraq. And I remember walking out of that movie and thinking that it was very heavily a talk about the bush white house so i that makes me lean a little bit towards lucas thinking that the the jedi were purposely supposed to be portrayed as hypocritical idiots but man he's so bad at writing (laughs) that it makes me not want to give him credit for something like that here's what i'll say he does broad strokes extremely well Mm mm-hmm and I think it's easy for us to, to, to rip on him because of, you know, how people have received the prequels, which I, I don't care for. But, like I've said to you many times, I don't know if I've said it on this podcast, one of the things that I appreciated of the prequels was that he did not do the Clone Wars how I expected. I expected, from the brief conversation in A New Hope, that Palpatine was going to create clones and use them to overwhelm the good guy Republic. That's not how he chose to do it. No. He had Palpatine work from the inside and turn it and turn the good guys into the bad guys, which was so much more nuanced and makes me appreciate. He does broad strokes really well. He does. In the first dialogue, he needs to stay away from dialogue. Well, and I think he's admitted that. He knows that he's not an he's not an actor's director and he isn't doesn't isn't good with dialogue and he's admitted that. Well, and sidetracking us a little, but I saw the news came out this week as well, which we didn't cover is that he tried to get Ron Howard to direct Phantom Menace. I didn't know that. Which, in my head, I went, oh, man. Like, I'm not a massive Ron Howard fan. 
I think he is competent. Mm. I don't think he's exceptional. He's made a few movies that I, I really enjoy. I think he is middle of the road in general, but he's very professional. And I, it makes me think that, man, if we could have removed Lucas from having total control of all the prequels, and that would have happened if Ron Howard would have said yes, what a different series of movies and probably significantly better movies we would have had if that would have happened. Yeah, in the prequels, there's nobody pumping the brakes for him. No. And you, and you see that when you have extremely successful musical artists. When they have a ton of success, they start believing that their shit doesn't stink. It happened with the Beatles, it happened with U2. You get some grandeur, and then all of a sudden, you think everything that you touch. And it's really that process of critique that helps a lot of people through. What I wanted to say, too, is the broad strokes. In the original trilogy, the Jedi are basically the good guys. They're lily white. They're perfect. And then in the prequels, it really flips out on its head. And you can make the argument that the Jedi are pricks. Like, they're, the only part about Anakin that I actually like is when he's talking about the Jedi are arrogant and that sort of thing. The thing is that I liked about The Last Jedi, to be honest with you. And so I, I would like to think... I'm not even going to say I would like to think. I believe that he did it on purpose. I think that's what he does really well. He does special effects and visuals, but he also does broad strokes of storytelling. And I do believe that he is very influenced, not by the Buddhist religion, because he's talked about how he's like a Buddhist Christian, but that idea of balance in Buddhism, I think, strikes him very hard. I think that was his intent to go back and re-examine the Jedi in the yeah. prequels. Yeah, I, I, I can get behind that. And I think you're 100% right. And I think people that want to bash Lucas uh, should really be bashing Rick McCollum. Because I think he's probably really the biggest villain. He's the lead producer on the prequels. And he was a, just a gigantic fanboy, yes man, who just did whatever Lucas told him. And no one ever pushed back. And the reason Empire Strikes Back is regarded as the greatest movie ever of Star Wars is because Irving Kirshner did what he wanted, not what Lucas wanted. And he got Carrie Fisher to rework most of the dialogue. And that's why that movie improves. That's why the performances are leaps and bounds better than A New Hope. Because Kirshner was good with actors. And because they were saying lines that actually made sense to say mm -hmm. from actual people. So, yeah. We got uh, we got a, a giant sidetrack on there. But I think it's a fun road to go down. Because I think it influences so much of what... We talk about when we talk about that era of Star Wars movies and the Clone Wars and all that is is what his real intentions were, even if he couldn't execute them as well as all of us would have liked. It even if half your brain is cottage cheese. It has to mean more for it to be as popular it is, as it is. It has to mean more than lightsabers, spaceships, and I think this is part of why Star Wars matters to so many people. I think, I don't remember if. I don't know if you remember, I wrote a story about Han Solo and the, the miniseries that uh, Marjorie Liu did, and in it I talked a lot about how it's really it really comes down to the characters and what they're going through, and that's more important than... I mean, we love lightsabers, don't get me wrong, but that's not why Star Wars matters. And I think this issue is why the Clone Wars matters to me. Nice. Let's get to the, the uh, other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. <laughs> There's a lot more of us in our view. Mr. Neitzel, what has got you going this week? So have you seen any of the the modern trilogy of Planet of the Apes? I have not. Movies? That, so I saw the first one that had James Franco and uh, real blah. Right. Uh, nothing special. And I didn't see the middle one, but I have HBO. And the third one was recently released on HBO. So I watched that one night because I just couldn't sleep and I was bored and wanted something to watch. Holy shit, I loved that movie. Yeah, I heard it's really good. Oh, the special effects are amazing. The performances are amazing. It is uh, What Andy Serkis is able to do with mocap is really pretty exceptional. The fact that the, the texture of the actual apes, like what they're able to do with fur and hair nowadays, you know, go back and look at a movie. Go back and, and watch Shrek. Because Shrek was really applauded for how well it did with hair mm. for humans at the time and it looks like it looks like someone just took a giant dump on on someone's head for hair compared to what they are able to do now with that technology and this is a really just fascinating movie i was captivated by it it flew by really quickly and i am desperate to see the middle one 
because the middle one and this one were both directed by Matt Reeves and the first one wasn't. And I am completely on board for whatever they're doing with these movies. And the way it ties into the original Planet of the Apes series is mind-blowingly well done. Like, really? I was absolutely, absolutely would recommend War for the Planet of the Apes. I hope everyone goes and watches it. I hope, I think the middle one is Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So I, I gotta find that so I can watch it, and hopefully it's on par. But this made me more excited for the Batman Mm -hmm. to come out because Matt Reeves is the guy in charge of that. I don't give a shit if it's Ben Affleck or I don't really want to. I want him to go back and tell I don't I don't need the old Batman. I'd like Yeah. I, I and I don't like care if Batman they do Batman. And I don't care if they do Jeffrey Dean Morgan in a Flashpoint version of Batman. I don't care if they recast Batman altogether, but I just want to see Matt Reeves do more stuff because I, this was a movie I expected absolutely zero out of and got just a huge amount of enjoyment out. So run and see that and i dumb concept to me not a franchise i was invested in i watched the original movies kind of as a you know joking type type mindset and i i loved this so run out and see that if you can find it that's awesome uh i also saw a new movie but it was a really really old movie from the way back in the 1931 boom and i today watched dracula and holy crap, I loved it. She liked it as much as Wolfman, which she really enjoyed. She and, and we're talking 1931 Bella Lugosi. Right. The, yes. the real freaking deal. So good. I, it's one of the, it's one of my favorite movies that I've seen. As far as the first time you see something, I thought it was scary. For 1931, obviously there's a lot of like cheesy stuff in there. But just the, the long way that he looks, they extend things, they do stuff with silence. I always think the gaps of no sound whatsoever in movies can be really haunting, and they do a great job of that. The facial features. Renfield, is that the guy's name? The, the, yep. the guy who's in the uh, mental institution, um, I thought just gave a wonderful performance, as well as Mina, I think her yep. name is. Just amazing to think that I could sit through a movie that was made in the 1930s because I, you know... Until recently, just could not. I mean, I'm just grabbing my uh, my iPad. But that, I got to thank you because you're the one who recommended these monster movies. Um, I am obsessed with the idea that they that they throw away the mummy and they come up with a new legitimate monster series. I have thought about who I would like cast in that series. I have thought about how I would like it to run. I I really think that they need to do a Van Helsing series. If you, I don't know if you've looked into that character, uh, but an extremely Extremely interesting character. Love the first two movies that I've seen, especially this Dracula one. I got thank you, man. And yeah. this gives me and my daughter something to do. She really loves these movies. Not scared at all. She they, just loves like the content. They're I, they're great movies. I bought the whole Universal uh, original movie monster classic, which is nice because Universal loves us so much. They do they love us. The they always watch our videos, which is amazing. So I, I'll probably throw a picture of Bella Lugosi in here just so that that intern has to watch our our podcast for this week. But those movies are really, really fun. And I've always been a fan of, I, if you, if you wanted to ask me, I would say the 1930s might be the best decade for movies. I think there's amazing things that came out of there. And I'm always blown away at what they were able to accomplish from a special effects standpoint at that time period. You know, Bela Lugosi's performance in there is amazing. Like he, 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 it's easy to look at it and go, "Oh, a long time ago, it was cheesy or well, whatever." The but bat like, is cheesy. The bat is cheesy. Sure. But at the same time, you're so into the story. It's like watching Star Trek in the 1960s. Like you forgive so much because you're focused on the story. You're focused on what's happening, and he is just magnetic. Oh, I mean, and like oh. you don't know what he's gonna do from scene to scene. No, he is completely captivating in that role. And you know, you you've watched Wolfman. You've watched. Dracula, I would probably lean towards Dracula's the best complete movie of the series. But man, I love The Invisible Man. I love Creature from the Black Lagoon. The Bride of Frankenstein is amazing. You guys have a lot of movies that I am excited for you to watch. So what are we watching they're... next, dude? What are we watching next? I, You know, n knowing Boom as well as I know Boom, I go Invisible Man. Okay. And, and while you're watching it, this probably won't have an effect on her because she's in first grade. But think about what they're accomplishing from a special effects standpoint in 1930. Mm -hmm. 33, I think that one is. 33, 34, somewhere around there. How they're able to pull that off to me. I spent half the movie, I spent just being like, 
I can't believe they were able to do this back then. Like, this is so well put together with how they do it. And it is violent and scary. I think I, I texted you when I was watching it the last time or whatever to be, I, I mean, they kill 130 some people in that movie. I mean, it is, it is a violent as all get out, but it's really fun and it's really enjoyable. Creature from the Black Lagoon is a great one too, because it starts right away and it, it obviously it has character development and it has some slowdowns or whatever, but it, it's going from the first minute and doesn't let up. Where, like, if you watch the original Frankenstein movie... Right. It's, like, one big, long, it's, slow... It's it's a script. slower movie. Like, I still think it's good, but I don't know if Boom's gonna love it. I mean, the actual Frankenstein monster's in there maybe seven, eight minutes. Mm-hmm. Total. Um, a lot of it is character work, which isn't gonna work for a little kid. Creature from the Black Lagoon is a movie that my brother and I watched. It, we, we probably had four or five movies that we got up on Sunday mornings, and we watched in a rotation, and it was uh, Night of the Living Dead... Day of the Triffids, King Kong, and Creature from the Black Lagoon. Because those are movies that just dive right into it, and they don't quit, and they're tons of fun. And as you grow older, you find more things in them to enjoy and appreciate, and everyone should watch these movies. How are they linked up? Was it just that they were done by Universal, or was it the similar directors? Like, I haven't looked into it much. I've just enjoyed the movies, so... They're... they're basically just because they were universal like they aren't a shared universe in that sense now you will have some crossovers where like laurel and hardy meet frankenstein and the wolfman and things like that but they're not in the kind of general Mm -hmm. universal continuity and it's it's not the same directors in fact um dracula in particular well like the two frankenstein movies are the same directors i mean there's a 20 year gap between most of these and Creature from the Black Lagoon. Creature from the Black Lagoon is in the 50s, okay. where most of these movies are in the 30s. Dracula is directed by Todd Browning, whose other big, massive, famous achievement, which I recommend everyone watch, and is um, the movie I end Halloween night with every year, is Freaks, which has the scariest last three minutes I think you will ever see in a movie. It's all character work until you get to that last three minutes, but that last three minutes is crazy insane how scary it is i'm gonna have to make it my way all through the monsters first yeah but but that's another uh, good one to throw in but i am just such an advocate of find old movies and watch them i mean the the best movie for me that was ever made it's not my favorite movie because i can't watch it all the time but the best movie to me ever made was metropolis it was made in the 20s it 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 does so much from a special effects standpoint that just blows my mind. It does so much as a silent film. It has so much depth and so much to say as well about society and how we treat people, things that are still relevant today, probably more relevant today right. than any time previously. Like, don't be turned off because a movie is black and white. Don't be turned off because a movie is silent. Just find something that has a concept that's interest for you and of interest to you and find the beauty within it because man, that just opens up the world of movies so much. Well, and what I enjoy about this too, is it is a very light version of a genre that my daughter loves. It's perfect. She loves scary stuff. I mean, ever since she was three years old, she wanted to dress up like a witch and she told my wife that she was going to put her in her potion. I mean, nice. my kid is my kid is the only goth cheerleader that I've ever met. But like, she just digs this stuff. She's not scared by it at all. She's just fascinated by it. She loves the black and white. She loves it. It's a great way to spend time with me and her. And uh, I can't thank you enough. So, Invisible Man is next in a couple of weeks. I'll let you know how it goes. Perfect. Well, that's all the show we got for today. Luke Neitzel, tell them about how to contact you. You can contact me semi regularly on Twitter. At Luke underscore Neitzel, which is N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. And I'm at Maya Madrid, but more importantly, we are at Kid Seriously, and we are at an end. We will see you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to Kid Seriously. This episode was recorded and produced at Camro Studios. Visit our website at www.kidsseriously.wordpress.com or email us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Kidsseriously. Until next time.